To look through the looking glass is to see the opposite of what is normal and expected. In recent years, I have felt an ever increasing burden of my humanity, a burden which has gained the name of climate anxiety. A visceral awareness of the planet's failing health, a situation which has been optically represented through the faces of suffering animals. Throughout the 21st century, wildlife images have appeared across newspaper spreads as victims of human destruction. Displaced, hungry and frightened animals such as koalas, orangutans and polar bears have come to represent human disregard for the natural world. Images synonymous with the Anthropocene narrative. Yet in 2018, something inspiring happened. A young girl, Greta Thunberg, sat in silence outside the Houses of Parliament in Sweden, asking why politicians were not taking the degradation of the natural world seriously. I needn't explain how this idea took hold, for the school strikes for climate are now global and ongoing. The significance of this for my own anthrozoological research, however, was that it showed me something subtle but important. For in that busy work day in the city of Stockholm, as thousands of city goers went about their day contributing to capitalism, one child sat silently, highlighted something incredible. She highlighted hope for a post-human future of multi-species flourishing. It is this hope that I seek to find in my own research into the human animal encounters in the wildlife trade. I like to think of the wildlife trade as a spider's web. Each strand of intersecting silk, a network of competing and conflicting motivations, personal investments and instinct, which when combined, makes an intricate and sticky web of opportunity and risk. Whilst my research tends to focus on the animals who get stuck, for some, the spider's web offers opportunity. I believe the wildlife trade can be described as what Singh calls awkward zones of engagement where post-human opportunities are being seized and multi-species flourishing can be created. For the past two years, I've been studying the ways in which Asian palm civets interact with humans with various contexts in the wildlife trade. Civets are a poorly researched mammal from an ancient lineage of cat-like animals, though for many species, their taxonomic classification is still debated. Arboreal, solitary and nocturnal, much of what we do know of civet behavioral ecology comes from the humans who live alongside them. Abundant throughout Southeast Asia with expansive ranges and adaptability to anthropogenic disturbance and a varied diet of rodents, birds, insects, plants, and fruits, civets have traditionally been captured and eradicated as farm pests. That is until civets became lively capital for international and national markets. Yet civets are responding to scenarios of exploitation in intriguing ways, ways which do offer some hope for symbiotic ways of living. Unable to travel to Indonesia in person, I've instead been observing the virtual realms of the human-animal interface. I view the internet as Haraway views the dog agility A-frame, a contact zone in which new worlds and possibilities are created. For through the sharing of animals and animal product images, the lives of animals and humans are shaped and connected. I will now show through two strands of the wildlife trade, copy luak tourism and the exotic pet trade, how civets challenge anthropocentric domination. Whilst the trades I describe involve commodification of living sentient beings for capitalist systems, I share these stories to illustrate the glimmers of hope I have found so that civets can become more than just icons of suffering. The first trade I'm going to introduce to you is what civets are most famous for, the production of coffee luwak or cat poo chino, the world's most expensive coffee made from the civet's digestive tract. The civet's digestive enzymes are said to produce a less bitter coffee, but it was its novel production that saw its rise to international fame in the early 2000s. Wild collection has now given way to cage production, and just as Foucault described biopolitics as the act of state control over human bodily processes, so too is this the case for civets embroiled in the copy luwak industry. State control of the civet is exerted by the Indonesian government, who issue permits for wild harvesting, captive husbandry, and home food production certificates to regulate the cage production of copy luwak. Copy luwak production is concealed, occurring in people's homes, backyards, and garages, 
in what Singh refers to as marginalised, out-of-the-way places. In Bali, however, Kopi Luwak tourism is emerging. Holiday makers are invited to curated sites to see how this unique coffee is created. In guided tours, civets are on display in cages so that tourists can see how the Kopi Luwak is processed from bean to cup through civic consumption and defecation, a phenomenon which has inadvertently led to the public witnessing of animal suffering. To understand the trends in tourist civic relations, I turn to TripAdvisor, the world's largest online tourist review platform. Here I documented animal suffering and new forms of exploitation taking hold, but so too did I see small glimmers of hope presented by the power of ethical consumer choices. Most fundamentally, it was the presence of caged civets that led people to question their own enrollment in capitalist systems. One such review reads, while looking at these depressed looking cat things, crapping out coffee beans, it reminded me of what my face must look like when I go to work on a Monday morning. The comparison made here demonstrates that caged civets were an evocative reminder of the unequal power dynamics that are inherent to the human and animal labor forces which prop up capitalist systems across the world. For others, however, empathy was felt more personally through an embodied knowledge of caffeine, as illustrated by one review which reads, the poor cats are so stressed that they are labeled aggressive, but how would you feel if you were kept in a box with nothing to eat but caffeine? The witnessing of civic suffering in Kopi Luwak tourism attractions was found to be a strong incentive to leave a negative TripAdvisor review in which users attempted to prevent further Kopi Luwak business. Many negative reviews included recommendations to avoid and boycott the attractions on the ground of animal cruelty. Therefore, amidst the exploitation, I could see growing opportunity for positive change as people were taking a stand and speaking for animals. Indeed, such approaches have already been effective for changes in the Kopi Luwak industry. It was animal rights campaigns which inspired the withdrawal of caged produce Kopi Luwak from Harrods and the implementation of certification schemes. In a world which is ever increasingly becoming virtually connected then, it was hopeful to see the innovative ways that the public spread messages to try and help these animals. The second glimmer of hope I found for animals within the wildlife trade came from within the emergent civet pet trade in Indonesia. The rise in humans seeking companionship with civets was of particular interest to me during a global coronavirus pandemic. You see, in addition to their mass farming for Kopi Luwak in Indonesia, in China civets are considered a delicacy. But it was the sale of live civets in wet markets in China that saw the 2002 emergence of SARS. Following an initial cover-up by the Chinese government over the spread and severity of the initial cases of infection, when the virus re-emerged in late 2003, the government ordered the immediate and public mass slaughter of more than 10,000 civets. So civets have been vilified as harbourers of disease, and their presence has been seen as a significant zoonotic danger just 10 years later, however, in Indonesia, civet lovers clubs are starting to emerge. Civet lovers clubs operate regionally and nationally, and the demographic is typically young men and women who are very active on social media. Civet lovers Facebook groups, Instagram accounts, and YouTube channels are really popular as virtual community spaces. Local gatherings allow owners and their pet civets to meet in person to socialise in public spaces such as parks and shopping malls, and national pet expos are hosted annually. Of course, whilst there's many more nuances involved in this human-animal encounter than I have time to explain today, I wanted to share with you some of the possible positives that I have come across within this emerging multi-species community. Firstly, in response to this new community, civets are changing, so much so that many companion civets now only tangentially resemble their wild heritage. Like the early domestication experiments of foxes in 1950s Russia, civets too have transformed through selective breeding. We are seeing domestication syndrome as it occurs. Brown mottled peelage gives way for white, black eyes turn to blue, long noses shorten, pointed ears become round, 
and territorial aggression is transformed into social affection towards their human caregivers. To select for these, these traits, breeders experiment by crossbreeding civets from different regions, an issue which could be considered as a conservation concern. The dilution of wild characteristics through the blurring of taxonomic boundaries degrades the purity of a species. Yet the plasticity of civet taxonomy is already evidenced by the ongoing classification debates, and without genealogical analysis, it's unclear if distinct civet species are actually being undone. Furthermore, I can't help but agree with conservationists who advise against viewing species as static entities. Instead, species can be explained as genetically variable entities, collectives of individuals who are connected genealogically with other species that still exist and those that have disappeared. Anthropologist Deborah Rose argues there is violence in generating categories which homogenizes biodiversity. As neither wild nor domestic, once again, the civet's liminality calls into question the legitimacy of human-defined taxonomic bounds. Furthermore, as civets become what Donaldson and Kimlicker describe as animal citizens, civet companions gain protections that their world counterparts lack. Protection from hunting and copy luwak production, for example. And they benefit from veterinary care, vaccinations and microchipping or further signs that their well-being and safety are valued by humans. But more than this, civet lovers communities are becoming a driver towards transforming traditionally held negative perceptions. Notable of late has been the way that the community has responded to COVID-19, a disease related to SARS to which civets of course are intimately linked. In response to COVID-19, both humans and civets were actively protected and multi-species health was heavily advocated for. Members frequently took to social media to promote the wearing of PPE, both at home when interacting with their civets during the COVID-19 lockdowns and later during in-person gatherings. Civet owners often speak of the privilege of civet companionship and the moral need to love nature and protect native wildlife. Indeed, much commentary surrounding civet companionship centers around the perceived conservation and protection of the wild, despite the civet's wildness being expunged through the civet breeding and pet keeping practice, a paradox I seek to explore further in my ongoing analysis. Most promising, however, amidst the complexities of this emerging trend, this community is proving to be a powerful consumer group driving the trade in Asian wildlife a consumer group whose acute species knowledge and large consumer reach could offer potential benefits for in-situ conservation and education initiatives. And what I found to have been most hopeful was when speaking to conservationists about this exact community, there was a general consensus that it is possible to find commonalities within conflict, a recognition of the potential presented in these awkward zones of engagement within the wildlife trade. Once we do this, we really can work collectively towards truly symbiotic relations with wildlife. In summary, despite the glimmers of hope within wildlife trades being small and fragmented, they do illustrate that wildlife needn't be defined only as victims of anthropocentric capitalist systems. Where the witnessing of suffering inspires empathy, it needn't serve only as reminders of the status quo. Instead, in a world of global connection, we can advocate for animals and other marginalized communities through the ethical consumer choices that we make. And finally, in a world where the fallacy of pristine nature has been revealed, we need to look through the looking glass into the trans species spaces that already offer us hope. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. <laughs>